tropes. Let's be real, there's a ton of them in anime. The man who couldn't talk to girls in one world is murdered and now he has a harem of 17 women who all want his children. The dumb, incredibly strong character. The main character who does everything right but every time he gets near the girl he likes, he clams up. There are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of tropes in anime. And while some of them get very, very old, very, very quickly, looking at you excessively cryy characters or excessively horny characters, there are some tropes that like a fine wine, age with time. Some tropes, no matter how many times I see it, every time I see it, it puts a smile on my face. And today we're gonna be talking about one of those tropes, arguably my favorite trope in all of anime, because today, we're talking about strong old men. Specifically, ranking and explaining the strongest old men in anime. See, the strong old man trope is a trope as old as anime. A character in their 60s or 70s or who's several centuries old pulling up on a battlefield and being one of the strongest people we've ever seen, usually by using the decades, if not centuries, of battle experience that they've gained. It doesn't matter how many times I'm introduced to a character that walks around with their hands behind their back until a battle starts. The second I see that old man shake off the weights and become the strongest person in the universe, I get way more invested in that anime. Which is why today we're going to be talking about the top 10 strongest old men in anime. And quite honestly, this list is going to have a lot of my favorite characters in fiction. So with no further ado, let's get into ranking and explaining the top 10 strongest old men in anime. But before we get to ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you love the idea of me talking about old men in anime, well, we don't really do it that much on my podcast, but I'll try and shoehorn some bits in there for you. The podcast is called Talk is Anonymous, and I do it every week with Danny Mata, where we break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So, old men in anime. While some of them are weak and frail and senile, it feels as though the majority of the old men we're introduced to in anime end up being some of the strongest people ever out there. Now this could be because in Japanese culture respecting the elderly is massively important, or because in Shinto lore your ancestors were on par with gods, or simply because a lot of mangaka want to reject the aging process that's slowing down how many chapters they can draw a week. Whatever the reason is, I don't mind, because there's nothing more badass than an old character walking up in a powerful universe and absolutely serving some young bull. Now keeping this list to only 10 people was difficult, mostly because I wasn't entirely sure where to draw the line between middle-aged man and old man. So I'm going to do a couple of honorable mentions, because I know if I don't mention at least a couple of these characters that I'm going to get a bunch of very angry comments. So my first up out of the honorable mentions is the owl. Well, more accurately, the one-eyed owl, because the owl is actually the one-eyed owl's daughter. Now, the one-eyed owl is actually a man by the name of Yoshimura, a triple S rated ghoul. Now, the reason that Yoshimura became the one-eyed owl, because he was trying to cover up what his daughter, the real owl, was doing. However, rather quickly, the CCG realized that there was two owls in play, and they began referring to the one-eyed owl as the non-killing owl. Now, this makes sense when you consider the fact that Yoshimura was the leader of the cafe that took Kaneki in, and tried to shepherd ghouls in the way of not consuming humans. Now, Yoshimura, as a ghoul himself, had ghoul physiology, which gave him superhuman speed, strength, dexterity, resilience, and a regeneration factor. But what made Yoshimura a bit unique is that he had both a Kagane and a Kakuja. Now, Yoshimura's Kagane allowed him to fire a continuous stream of projectiles. However, he was able to fire these projectiles from more than just his Kagane. He was able to fire these projectiles from any part of his body. And these projectiles could either come out as a continuous stream or fan out like a shotgun blast. But Yoshimaru wasn't only confined to long distance combat, as his Kakucha that he got through cannibalizing other ghouls allowed him to manifest two scimitars. And with the combination of his swords and the projectiles coming out from every part of his body, Yoshimaru was able to battle against multiple special glass investigators simultaneously, which is how he gained the triple S rating. My second and final honorable mention is going to be Silver's Rayleigh. Now, I understand that Silver's is 76 and therefore is definitely old enough to be on this list and is also definitely strong enough to be on this list. But I just finished Dressrosa. I really don't know how powerful Silvers is. I know he recently reappeared in the manga, and I saw him battle against Kizaru and Sabaody Archipelago, but I feel like I don't have enough information about Silvers to add him on this list and do him any real justice. And with those two honorable mentions out of the way, with no further ado, let's get into our top 10 strongest old men 
in anime. And coming in at number 10, we have Yoshinobu Gakuganji, also known as the principal of Kyoto Jujutsu High, the place where Toji and Mekamaru go to school. Now, outside of being the principal of Kyoto Jujutsu High, he's also one of the higher ups in Jujutsu society, being one of the voices that makes decisions for the Jujutsu society as a whole, and therefore being one of Gojo's least favorite people on earth. Now, when it comes to appearance, Yoshinobu is not somebody you would assume to be powerful, which I guess is gonna be a pretty common phrase we say during this list. However, when Yoshinobu gets ready for combat, you realize why he was elected principal of Kyoto's Jujutsu High. See, when it comes to movesets in JJK, Yoshinobu has one of the cooler ones, as Yoshinobu channels all of his cursed energy through the medium of music. Now, for a while, the only way we thought he was able to channel his energy was through an electric guitar. In the second to most recent chapter in JJK, chapter 223, we saw that he was helping Udahime boost Gojo's cursed energy output, but he wasn't using his electric guitar, he was using... I think it's called a biwa. Oh my God, it is called a biwa, I'm not. But the technique that Yoshinobu uses is relatively easy to understand. Yoshinobu uses his own body as an amplification machine. And by making his body his own amp, he amplifies his own cursed energy through the means of sound waves that he creates. And then these sound waves travel as waves of cursed energy. And when these sound waves or these waves of cursed energy hit you, it does damage. Now, technically we've seen Yoshinobu battle twice. Once in the manga and once in the anime. Well, I guess that would technically be twice in the manga, but you get it. Now, the first time that we ever see him use his techniques is against Juzo. See, while technically Juzo was listed as not nearly as threatening as the special grade curses that showed up during the Goodwill event, he did have an incredibly high amount of curse energy and wielded some of the strongest curse tools in JJK, as he was creator of curse tools and the creator of Dragon Bone, which is now Maki's greatest weapon. However, before Yoshinobu and Juzo can truly fight, Gojo shows up and flattens all four of Juzo's limbs. However, after flattening Juzo's limbs, Gojo says something rather peculiar to Yoshinobu. He tells Yoshinobu, Yoshinobu that they need him for questioning and that Yoshinobu should heal him, implying that Gojo knows that Yoshinobu is capable of reverse curse technique, which is a relatively rare thing in the JJK universe. So outside of this in the manga, we also know that Yoshinobu was able to defeat a high level grade one sorcerer whose name I'm not going to reveal because it's a massive spoiler, meaning that Yoshinobu is very easily a grade one sorcerer, though not a special grade sorcerer because there's only four of those. But enough about a character that's only gotten like three minutes of collective screen time. Let's go to our number nine spot. Zeno, and not the little purple alien from Dragon Ball Z, no. Zeno Zoldic, Kilua's grandfather, Silva's father, the true current patriarch of the Zoldic family. Though technically Zeno's father, Maha, is still alive and very active in the assassination game. Actually, we don't even know if that's true because in a 2004 data book, it said that Maha was Zeno's father, but also kind of got retconned in chapter 264 of the manga. Because in chapter 264 of the manga, we see that there's somebody between Maha and Zeno. However, we don't know that person. They kind of look like Garo, Loki. Now, when it comes to the old man trope in anime, Zeno, while he may not look super intimidating, has always been very intimidating to me, which is most likely because he's always wearing a tapestry that says one kill per day, meaning he needs to kill one person every single day, at least. Though, as you spend more time with Zeno throughout the plot of Hunter x Hunter, you realize he's actually kind of a good guy. See, when Zeno attacks the Chimera Ant hideout and uses his dragon dive and rains down on the entire fortress, he realizes that he injures Komogi, who he deems to be an innocent person. And he's so dejected by the news that he might have killed an innocent that... He just dips out of the arc. As he tells Shido, the reason he doesn't want to fight against him is because he might have killed the first innocent person in his entire lifetime. And it's really affecting him. Now, does that stop Silva from crushing Shido's head in? No. And honestly, thank God for it. It's an incredible scene. Now, Zeno is the reflection of nearly a century of being trained to be an assassin. And honestly, he shows it. As Zeno told an entire group of mafia members that it would only take him seven seconds to kill every single one of them, and told Krolo, one of the strongest people in the universe, that if he wanted to truly kill Zeno, he was gonna have to take the fight seriously. And Zeno can back all of this up, as he's one of the most talented Nen users in all of Hunter x Hunter. See, Zeno is an admitter, but also an incredibly talented transmuter. But on top of being probably the most talented admitter in all of Hunter x Hunter, his Nen reserves are insane, as Zeno is able to stretch his N 300 meters in all directions, meaning anything within 1,000 feet of Zeno will be detected the second it gets close to it. But in combat is where Zeno truly shines. See, we saw Zeno use a myriad of emission techniques in his battle against Krola, like when he used his Aura Blast that was able to destroy the entire room they were fighting in and lightly injure Krola. But objectively, the cooler techniques that Zeno uses are his transmutation techniques, like his Dragon Head transmutation technique, where he transmutes his Aura into a tangible extension in the shape of a dragon, which he can 
continues to lunge at his enemy or simply fire dragons off at them in combination with his admission techniques. Because the second that Aura leaves your body, it becomes an admission technique. But outside of being able to manipulate a Nen Dragon for combat abilities, Zeno was also able to manifest this Dragon Ed to fly on, which is how he got himself and Netero to the battlefield against the Chimera Ants. And one of the craziest things about Zeno is the fact that he can maintain this Dragon Head from kilometers away. See, Netero and Meruem rode the Dragon Head to an area miles away from the palace so their battle wouldn't hurt any more innocents. But the thing is, Zeno wasn't there on top of it guiding it. He was controlling that dragon, bringing it to a location miles from his physical body, meaning he was constantly transmuting his aura into that shape and admitting it to control it over there, which isn't even the craziest combination of admission and transmutation Nen technique he has, because that would be Dragon Dive, which is the ability to split his dragon head into a falling rain of stars. Well, I guess the more accurate summation would be he breaks this large dragon head into hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller aura dragon heads. And while this technique can't kill high-level threats like the Royal Guard or Meruem, it was able to decimate the entirety of the Chimera Ant's palace in one go, as every single aura dragon was able to pierce through multiple levels of concrete. When it comes to all of the old men on this list, Zeno is probably the last one you want to betray. But Zeno isn't even the strongest old man from his universe. No, that title would go to the person he brought to the Chimera Ant Palace, Isaac Netero. See, Netero is one of the older old men on this list, being anywhere between 110 and 120 years old at the time of his death. And Netero, for more than half of his life, has been known as the strongest Nen user in the world. See, Netero, when he believed his power had reached a plateau, went into the mountains to pray. And he prayed every single day. And after every single prayer, he would throw a punch. He practiced this movement for years, if not decades, until eventually he was able to pull off this movement in 0.1 seconds. And from these possible decades training in the mountains, Netero gained the ability, the 100 type Guanin Baritstapha. This technique allows Netero to summon a massive Nen construct that takes the form of a 100 armed Guanyin, which in an Anglo-Saxon way of describing is essentially the God of Mercy. And now every single one of these 100 arms unleashed a different attack. And before every single one of these attacks, Netero would do a prayer motion and then unleash one of the hands. This technique happened so fast and was so powerful that when Pito jumped at Netero, he hit her with a palm strike that knocked her miles away before she even registered what happened. On top of this, all of these 100 moves can be used in combination with each other, which made Meruem realize that the amount of combinations that Netero was able to pull off with this Guan Yin are almost limitless. And it was only because of Meruem's proclivity for playing board games and trying to break the habits by identifying the unconscious bias of the people he was playing in these board games that Meruem realized that Netero has an unconscious bias towards using different combinations. And once he figured out this unconscious bias, he was able to get to Netero faster than Netero could react. Now, while the majority of the hands of the hunter type Guan Yin are just one strike, the 99th hand allows Netero to strike multiple times without praying in between. And these strikes are so powerful that he was able to blast Netero through the ground into an underground bunker. Now, mind you, Netero and Meruem battled for hours, and all the damage that Netero was able to inflict on Meruem was relatively surface level. And the most damage that Netero was ever able to do to Meruem was through the use of his zero hand, which focuses all of Netero's aura into the mouth of the Guan Yin and fires it as a beam at whatever enemy that the Guan Yin has in its hands. Now, since this technique uses all of Netero's aura, it essentially kills, it, which is bad news for you if you survive, because once Netero's heart stops, it releases a bomb, a bomb known as the Dictator's Rose, which is essentially a dirty bomb that poisons anybody who happens to get blasted with it, should they survive the blast. Now, mind you, this blast was strong enough to basically leave Netero as a Chimera Ant's Nugget. Possibly even more nefarious than this, anybody who is poisoned by this bomb poisons anybody they come into contact with. And what's craziest about all of this is that Netero hypothesizes that he's only had 50% of his strength in his old age. Meaning, if Netero had fought Meruem in his prime, he would have been twice as strong. Which is terrifying when you think about the fact that Netero, at the height of his battle against Meruem, was able to launch 1,000 attacks a minute. And also had such control over his body and his Nen and his endurance that once Meruem cut off parts of his body, he could simply come into contact with them and close the wounds. Netero is, was, and will always be a certified badass. However, unfortunately, all the praying in the world won't make him as strong as 
as our next entry on this list because coming in at number seven, we have a Noki. This is the second video in a row I've done this. I accidentally have two number one spots. So if I've been messing up the numbers, I'm sorry. We are most definitely on number seven. When you think old men in Naruto, your first thought may not be a Noki, but arguably it should be. Anoki is the only person in the entirety of the Naruto universe who lived through all four ninja wars. And even though he was in his mid eighties in the fourth grade Shinobi world war, Madara marked him as the most dangerous person in the allied Shinobi forces, saying that his abilities would be the most meddlesome against the likes of Madara. He has been the third Tsuche Kage since the first great Shinobi world war, meaning he has led Iwa for almost 50, maybe 60 years. And while in his early days, obviously him and Mu both got slapped around by Madara when he just popped over to Iwa to show Konoha's superiority, I guess. With time, it seems as though Anoki only got stronger. Though the version we see of him in the fourth great Shinobi World War is substantially nerfed, which is crazy when you consider the fact that he went toe to toe with the likes of Mu, who was his former master and who died in the prime of his life, but was brought back with an Edo Tensei body. And since Mu died in the prime of his life, his Edo Tensei body was relatively powerful, not to mention had infinite regeneration and infinitely refilling chakra. And when Tsunade was boosting his chakra in their battle against Madara, he was able to destroy five of Madara's Susano clad in shadow clones with his particle release. See, Anoki is able to use Earth, Wind, Fire, Lightning, and Yang release. However, when he combines Earth, Wind, and Fire, he doesn't get catchy music. He gets dust release or particle release, a technique that allows him to create a geometric shape that destroys anything it comes into contact with. And as this is a combination of three different elemental releases, it's referred to as a Keke Toda, one passed down to him by Mu, the inventor of it. And Anoki, with the power of this technique, is able to wipe out entire islands in massive forests. He can also hit incredibly quick moving objects, like meteors that were showering down on Iwa during Naruto the Last. But dust release isn't everything to Anoki. He's also incredibly talented when it came to earth release, being able to clad his fists in earth release to increase his punching ability, being able to control something weight, making it either incredibly heavy or incredibly light, which he used on himself to make himself be able to fly. He was able to create massive stone golems that could aid him in combat, and his control over Earth release was so precise and so powerful, he was able to essentially stop one of Madara's meteorites. Now, obviously he was helped by Gara and the rest of the Shinobi allied forces. Without Anoki flying against the meteorite and making it lighter with his technique, Madara wouldn't have needed a second meteorite. But Anoki isn't the end of the old men in Naruto. No, because coming in at our number six spot is the real old man you think about when you think of Naruto, Hiruzen. See, love him or hate him, Hiruzen was an incredibly powerful character. Hiruzen, much like Anoki, was the longest serving Hokage in the Leafs history. Outside of being the longest tenured Hokage in the Leafs history, in the early days of Naruto, Hiruzen was referred to as the strongest Hokage in history, with early data books slightly corroborating this point. Now, obviously, everything we've seen from Hiruzen kind of flies in the face of him being stronger than Hashirama and Tobirama, or even Minato for that matter. Him being dubbed the God of Shinobi long before Hashirama was dubbed the God of Shinobi, Nobi definitely points us in the right direction when talking about his strength. See, unfortunately for us, we never really got to see what a Prime Hiruzen looked like, as he was almost 70 years old when he died. But we can assume that Prime Hiruzen was a menace. One, he was the sensei of the legendary Sanin, three of the strongest ninjas in Konoha's history. One of which was Jiraiya, who was offered to be the Hokage four times, and Tsunade, who was the fifth Hokage. And now Orochimaru, who is one of the strongest ninjas in all of Naruto's history, not just Konoha's. Now, Hiruzen was able to wield all five Five elemental releases and yin and yang, making him one of only 10 or so people in the entirety of the Naruto universe capable of doing that. And like I've already said, the data books kind of swing Hiruzen's way when talking about power, as Hiruzen was picked directly by Tobirama to be the third Hokage, with the fourth data book stating that Hiruzen had surpassed his teacher, Tobirama, in his childhood. And with the first data book saying that Hiruzen was the strongest Kage of his lifetime, and him and Hashirama were alive simultaneously. Now, if you want to highball Hiruzen, you could say that that's corroborated by his battle against the Rochimaru, where he battled not only against the Rochimaru, but the reincarnated versions of Hashirama and Tobirama, all while being old and significantly out of his prime, and thus very much weaker than he was in his prime. And when it comes down to it, he was heavily nerfed by age. As Orochimaru, after their battles, stated that if Hiruzen was even 10 years younger, he would have killed Orochimaru. But the thing is, Hiruzen was semi-successful in his battle 
against the Orochimaru. Being able to use Reaper Death Seal with two other clones to seal both Hashirama, Tobirama, and Orochimaru's arms. Now, what's technically kind of crazy about this feat is that Reaper Death Seal is a tug of war based on chakra, and you can only pull out 100% of somebody's soul if you have more chakra than them. Which, if you want to take things super loosely here, means that Hirazin in this weakened old state had more chakra than both Hashirama and Tobirama combined. Now, obviously, Orochimaru hadn't mastered Edo Tensei yet, so to assume that Hashirama and Tobirama were at their strongest here, it's kind of a stretch, especially when you consider the fact that during this fight, Hiruzen states that splitting his chakra to any more than two clones would put his life in danger. But Hiruzen offsets a significant nerf to his chakra pool by controlling his chakra at one of the highest levels we've ever seen. See, Hiruzen was known as the Professor and had mastered every single jutsu of the leaf. And the only jutsu from the leaf that he couldn't use was Flying Raiju. This is why we see Hiruzen, especially after he's brought back during the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, use a myriad of different jutsus. And while some of the jutsus we see him use are stupid, like Roof Tile Shirt, Kinjutsu, Hiruzen during the Fourth Great Shinobi World War was kind of a menace, as he did have mastery over all five elemental releases and at an incredibly high level. Tie all that into the fact that he has probably the strongest summon in the entirety of the universe, Monkey Kin Enma, who's able to turn into an infinitely extendable adamantite staff. Adamantite is the strongest material in all of Naruto, it's basically impenetrable. Even Orochimaru's Kusanagi Blade, which is said to be able to cut through anything, couldn't cut through adamantite, though Monkey Kin Enma said that he would be bruised if he was hit by it a lot. And even in Hiruzen's old age, in the data book, he received a 34, which is a half point higher than both Alive Itachi and Jiraiya at his peak. So you may not love him for completely abandoning Naruto, and honestly, fair. But when it comes to power, Hiruzen's was unmatched. Except, of course, maybe by our number five spot on this list, Whitebeard, also known as Edward Newgate, one of the four emperors of One Piece. Well, at least he was before Blackbeard. Now, Whitebeard was the captain of the Whitebeard Pirates and known as the strongest man in the world. So he only gained this moniker after Gold D. Roger's death. Though it was said that his strength was comparable to that of Gold D. Roger as Whitebeard was his rival, which is corroborated by the fact that Whitebeard held the second highest bounty in history, second only to Gold D. Roger. Now, the majority of Whitebeard's power came from his devil fruit, the Quake Quake Fruit, which he used to battle against Gold D. Roger for days, with the battle eventually ending in a tie. But in a relatively common thread that we're gonna see throughout this entire list, Whitebeard, for the majority of the time we know him, is significantly nerfed. Whitebeard has to be constantly connected to a myriad of different machines and IVs that keep him alive. But even in this weakened state, he's still able to defeat the likes of Ace over 100 times. Even when Ace tried to attack him while he was sleeping. Now, this nerfing was only made worse by the fact that in the Battle of Marine Ford, Whitebeard refused to go into the battle while connected to his life support, which meant that the longer that the battle went on, the worse his health got. Which is honestly a good thing for the Navy because Whitebeard in the deteriorated state still went against all three of the admirals relatively simultaneously. And after Akainu did, you know, his thing, Whitebeard in this highly injured state with hundreds of stab wounds and bullet wounds stepped up and almost killed Akainu with one blow. Now, mostly this strength comes from his actual physical strength. We've seen him stop strikes from giants one-handed. We saw him stop Squard's paddle boat with one hand. There's a reason he was known as the strongest man in the world when giants exist. But on top of being incredibly strong, even in this nerfed state, he was fast enough to speed blitz Akainu, with Akainu only realizing that he was being jumped by Whitebeard when his soldiers yelled out. But on top of that, Whitebeard was the wielder of the Quake Quake Fruit, said to be the strongest out of all of the Paramecia-type devil fruit. And according to Sengoku with this power, Whitebeard could destroy the world. Which makes sense when we consider the fact that in this incredibly weakened state, he managed to tilt the entirety of Marine Ford and the ocean around it. And not to mention with the Quake Quake Fruit, he was able to battle against the Magna Magna Fruit, which has the highest level of attack power out of all of the Devil Fruits in One Piece. Tie this into the fact that Whitebeard was one of the strongest users of Conquerors, Armament, and Observation Hockey out there, and you got a scary 72-year-old man. Not not quite as scary as our number four entry on this list, Bang. Why not you put it back from one place, man, over Edward Newgate? Yes. Pretty easily, actually. Bang, also known as S-Class Hero number three from One Punch Man, is one of the strongest old men 
in history. Sibang is the creator and teacher of the water stream rock smashing fist. However, that's not always who Bang was. He used to be referred to as Wind of Blood, but that was back when he was young and he used a different fighting technique known as exploding heart release fist, which was an entirely offensive focused martial arts that would explode the hearts of those he was fighting against. However, after losing his way as a martial artist and being corrected by being defeated by his brother Bong, Bang changed his style to the water stream rock smashing fist, which is more defensive and redirection focused. Now, here's the thing about Bang. While we have seen some very impressive feats from him, there's also some moments that are not so impressive from him. See, we've seen Bang in the early days of One Punch Man, that is, the parts of One Punch Man that have actually been animated, fly out of the sky and punch Garo into the ground and create a crater the size of a city block. We saw him easily defeat the likes of Fist Fight Jin, a demon level threat, and we saw him, when working together with Bomb, knock back Elder Centipede and destroy its caprice. Now, obviously, this wasn't enough to kill Elder Centipede, but the only person who was able to kill Elder Centipede was Saitama, which isn't really a knock against Bang. On top of this, destroying Elder Centipede's caprice in the first place is incredibly impressive when you think about the fact that that caprice was able to withstand not only Metal Bat swings, but Metal Knight's missiles. Not to mention during the Monster Association arc that Bang went up against Fewer Ugly and Gums simultaneously and managed to critically injure both of them. Fewer Ugly and Gums are two of the strongest dragon level threats we've ever seen. On top of this, Bang was able to outrun a falling spaceship and is faster than Atomic Samurai, a man with the capability to quite literally dice a person on a microscopic level thousands of times in less than a second. Not to mention that Bang has sparred with the other S-Class heroes multiple times, sparring with the likes of Darkshine and Metal Bat, neither of which were able to hit him once. But the true, genuinely most impressive thing about Bang is that he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Evolved Gara. Now, one will say, well, yeah, but he lost that battle. And here's the thing. He did lose this battle against Evolved Garo, but he also could have won. See, Bang is absolutely piecing up Evolved Garo for a chapter or two until Evolved Garo proceeds to use his Explosion Heart Release Fist, which apparently he found the scroll that Bang hid a couple of years ago when he used to be his student. And after simply reading it once, he was able to master it. Now, Bomb states that if Bang had also used that fist, he would have defeated Evolved Garo. But Bang willingly decides not to and continues to use his redirection and defensive fist. And because of that, Bang loses. Now, well, technically, this is just speculation. If we put this old and kind of nerf version of Bang on slightly equal footing with Evolved Garo, that scales him to an insane level. Evolved Garo was able to defeat Evil Mineral Water, the combined versions of Gums and Fewer Ugly, and another dragon level threat in three one hundred thousandth of a second. Mind you, every single one of these dragon level threats was really pushing what it meant to be a dragon level threat. After defeating those three dragon level threat, he went on to battle against Flashy Flash and Platinum Spur. Flashy Flash being the fastest out of all of the S-Class heroes, massively faster than Light, and was still completely outclassed in terms of speed and strength by this version of Garo. Then, after defeating Flashy Flash, Garo and Platinum Sperm battled against each other. And in this battle, they moved so fast that they left a labyrinth of lights that spanned hundreds of miles, all in 1,700 millionths of a second, which makes this fight also massively faster than light. This version of Garo also goes on to defeat Sage Centipede pretty much by himself, even though Metal Bat was there as well. So yeah, the fact that Bang was in that battle at all, and it was loosely implied that he could have won, puts him fairly far above everybody else on this list we've listed thus far. But not quite as high as our top three, because coming in in third, we have Yamamoto. Specifically, Captain Yamamoto, the captain of the first division of the Gotei 13 in Bleach. Being the strongest man outside of the Royal Guard in the entirety of the Soul Society. Now, Yamamoto was kind of in a two-man race for oldest person on this list, as it's implied at his death that he was close to 2,100 years old, making him probably view everybody else on this list as children. What made this old man so powerful? Was it experience, bloodlust, his bankai? How about all three? Yamamoto is so powerful that he was able to battle against two of the strongest captains in the history of the Soul Society, Shunsui and Jusiro, simultaneously and leave the battle with no sign of injury. But here's the thing, Yamamoto is so strong that he doesn't even need his Zanpak toe half the time, as it's clear that his prowess with his fist is almost as good as with his sword. As with just his fists alone, Yamato was able to smash through a spot of level 
Cavalieros, which is like an Espada's armor. With his fists, he has two techniques, Ikotsu and Sokotsu, which roughly translates to single bone and double bow. With the power of Ikotsu, Yamato was able to destroy the entirety of Wonder Weiss's abdomen. And with the power of Sokotsu, he was able to destroy pretty much the entirety of Wonder Weiss. I mean, it's head was still there. On top of this, Yamamoto was one of the most talented Keto masters in the universe, being able to use Keto's without even calling out their names. Now, mind you, the longer the incantation you use for Keto, usually the stronger they are. And the higher the number of the Keto, the stronger it is. Which is why it was terrifying when Yamamoto used Hado 96 at a high level of efficiency without an incantation. They only go up to 100, mind you. The Yamamoto has been the head of the Gote 13 for over a thousand years. And in those 1,000 years, there's never been a Shinigami stronger than it. Even I Aizen stated that if he was to battle Yamamoto straight up, he would lose. Which is backed up by the fact that, oh, what is it? Ya, ya, hua, how do you say it? Ha, wa, ya, hua, ba, ya, ya, hua, ba. God, I am not looking forward to July when this show comes back. I mean, I am looking forward to the show coming back, but I'm going to have to talk about it. And I'm going to have to say this Yiddish name that everyone's like, oh, Nick, you can't say Yiddish. What's wrong with you? I looked it up. It's Yuhapa. You would figure the Jew would know, but no. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Yamamoto was the person who defeated Yahaba a thousand years ago. And even in TYBW, Yahaba decides to trick Yamamoto to tire him out before facing him directly. Now, this is mostly because of Yamamoto's Zanpakuto, which in its Shikai form alone is terrifying. Its Shikai command is reduce all creation to ash, which is terrifying. And when a Shikai, Ryo Jinjaka, is released, it emits fire so hot that it melts away the clouds in the sky and immediately evaporates all of the water in the Serate. And the fire emitted from his Shikai is so powerful that the only people in the Serate who could resist it were Shunsui and Ukitate. The flames are so hot that one of the Stern Ritters that invade the Serate during Thousand Year Blood War arc's first arc, Driscoll, is immediately incinerated when these flames come into contact with it. Now, mind you, Driscoll is a captain level threat. But Yamamoto can do a lot with these flames. Things like Jokaku Enjo, which creates a massive wall of flame that's so powerful that the likes of Aizenjin and Tosen couldn't go through it. Taimatsu, which creates a giant wave of flames that incinerate anything it touches. And lastly, Entetsu Jikoku, which creates seven pillars of flame that incinerate anything thing that happens to be within those pillars. It's said that the effective range that Yamamoto can create is larger than that of Karakura Town, but we haven't even got to his Bunkai. See, Yamamoto's Bunkai release actually gets rid of all of the flames made by his Shikai release as they go into his sword, and more specifically, into the tip of his sword. The flames of this Bunkai are so hot, they're invisible, being claimed to be as hot as the sun. In fact, Unahana states that if this Bunkai is released for too long, it will destroy the entirety of the Serate, simply by just existing. Now, this Bankai has four abilities. Zanka no Tachi, North, South, East, and West. Now, East automatically happens the second the Bankai is released, and it concentrates the flames of the sun into the tip of his blade. This means that anything touched with the tip of that blade is incinerated out of existence immediately. Even the Van der Rijk's Blut Vein is irrelevant, and that's one of the strongest defensive abilities in all of Bleach. God, do I just wish that TJ Koba would have sticked to, oh, I don't know, one language when making up abilities? Yeah, why don't we have Yiddish and German? German and Japanese and Spanish. Yeah, throw it all in there. So Nick gets to oscillate between Yamamoto, Van der Weyck, and Yachaba. Back to the Bankai release. The West move of this Bankai is also released immediately as the Bankai is released. This technique engulfs Yamamoto's body in flames that are 15 million degrees Celsius. However, these flames are so hot that they're invisible. But what this does mean is that while his Bankai is released, he cannot be touched. The South move of his Bankai allows him to bring back and reanimate all of the people he's killed with these flames. And Yamamoto has been killing people for two millennia. So it's quite the necromancer's wet dream. In the north move of his Bankai is just a slash that incinerates anything that it touches out of existence. So yeah, long story short, there's an army of about a million zombies trying to kill you. He is 15 million degrees Celsius, so you can't touch him. And if he touches you, well... Bye bye. There's a reason that there's never been a Shinigami stronger than him. But enough about Shinigami, let's get to our number two spot. Because coming in at our number two spot, we have one of the most iconic anime characters in history, Master Roshi. Master Roshi is one of the strongest humans in history. He's the creator of the Kamehameha Wave, and even in the early days of Dragon Ball, which aired 40 years ago, he destroyed the moon, making him 40 years ago low planetary. Well, that and that alone would put him in contention with the majority of the old men on this list. Dragon Ball Super has had some separate plans for Roshi. See, Roshi doesn't really do anything in Dragon Ball Super until the revival of Frieza arc. However, during this arc, he kills 170 of Frieza's soldiers. 
features, all of which are comparable to Raditz in strength, which means he's massively stronger than both Goku and Piccolo in the early days of Dragon Ball Z, putting him probably somewhere in the region of Super Saiyan 1 Goku the first time he did it. But this isn't even close to the most impressive thing that Master Roshi has done in Super. See, Master Roshi, while controlled in kind of a Chinese vampire kind of situation, was able to exchange blows with base Goku. And in this exchange of blows, Goku was complimenting Master Roshi, saying, I never knew you were this strong. Why have you been hiding this? Now, ultimately, of course, Master Roshi is defeated by a Kamehameha wave from Goku, kind of fitting. And Roshi is able to defeat the likes of Tien and battle against high-level aliens in the Tournament of Power, like Frost. So all in all, he's very easily a planetary level threat, which in my opinion, puts him higher than anybody else on this list. But it doesn't put him higher than our number one spot on this list, because on our number one spot on this list, we have a god. Yes, because at our number one spot, we have Zeus from Record of Ragnarok. See, well, even though Record of Ragnarok is a story all about gods and humans, Zeus is the chairman and the leader of all of the gods. He's even referred to as the godfather of the cosmos in Record of Ragnarok, implying he might be the oldest god amongst all of them, which would by far and away make him the oldest person on this list because he's possibly as old as existence itself. And beside being the oldest god, he's referred to as the final boss, by goal. And it was actually after winning a tournament amongst all of the gods to see who was the mightiest that he was elected as the leader of the gods, becoming the ruler of both the cosmos and heaven. Which makes sense when you consider the fact that Heimdall stated that Zeus had near omnipotent ability, having the power of creation at his whim. Therefore, anything he doesn't like, he destroys. He was also present for the Big Bang and enjoyed watching it happen, and it was stated in his final form he could destroy heaven. Zeus is also able to blatantly disrespect other gods, like Ares and Shiva. It's stated that he's so fast that he can launch punches and kicks, possibly faster than time itself, with the fastest punch we've ever seen thrown from him being delivered in one one hundred millionth of a second. On top of this, his durability is second to none. Remember, he was there for the Big Bang, and twice Zeus has been hit with a punch that surpassed time from Adam, meaning possibly an infinite speed punch, which would have infinite force. However, after entering his Adam state, his big muscular state, it's stated that he's possibly indestructible. Oh, and earlier I misspoke when I said that the fastest punch he ever threw happened in one one hundred millionth of a second. It actually happened in one, and then there's 20 zeros of a second. So the punch that he threw happened in point, 20 zeros, and then one second. And also, once again, I lied. His Atomus state is actually not when he's muscular. It's when he gets really skinny. However, he's only able to hold this Atomus form for 12 to 13 minutes. But in his fight against Adam, since he had been severely injured by Adam, he was only able to hold it for five to six minutes. But in this form, Zeus is able to launch attacks that contain the entirety of his divine might. And this is the form where Shiva believed he could destroy heaven, which is either a dimension or a concept, depending on how you want to look at it. So yes, he's both the oldest and the most powerful out of all of the old man trope characters in anime. So he's going to get the number one spot. But what do you guys think? Did I forget some other super old god in anime? Did you agree with my list? Is there anybody you would have loved to see on my list? Tell me in the comments below and why you guys are down there. Please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell. See me when I'm old, I'm not going to be strong. You know what I'm going to do? The second I hit 75, I'm giving up on life, but not really. I'm just going to get whatever form of AI VR we have currently. And I'm just going to live in that full time, like Kirito in the nerve gear, except I can take it off. I just choose not to.